thrilled to be able to introduce uh, Doug Smith. He is the Yellowstone National Park wolf biologist. He's been working with wolves for over 38 years, uh, not only in Montana, but um, in the Upper Peninsula and the Island of Royale of Michigan as well. Um, I will let his talk speak for himself. Thank okay, you great. Thank you, Stella. Um, well, wonderful to be here. Um, been in Montana and Yellowstone for a long time, and uh, first time I've been to Montana Tech, so I very much appreciate uh, the invitation. Um, I did bring some reading materials. This is our 2016 annual report. Um, 2017's not over yet, so we don't have that one ready. And this is a magazine published by Yellowstone that comes out three times a year, and this issue was completely dedicated to wolves. So this is an attempt to try and summarize about 20 years of wolf research and management in Yellowstone. I always forget to tell folks that I have these, so um, feel free to take them. And then I brought some a wolf pelt, some radio collars, a track. Um, don't normally bring that, but Stella said people love that kind of thing, so feel free to check it out. Um, if I get time, I'll talk about it. But uh, this collar here, actually, we put out last winter. And as incentive to get through my talk on time, I can't get excited and go too long. But the last five minutes is video footage of us helicopter darting wolves that we took from GoPros on top of our flight helmets. We put this collar out on a wolf less than a year ago. And you can see normally it's got strapping on it like that. And all the strapping completely got chewed off by a wolf pup. So we put this on a pup and another pup chewed it off. So this is very frustrating and annoying. Um, so we just pulled this out of the field the other day. This is the internal antenna. So you can take a look at that. Um, and then I have this footage of how we catch them. So I'll try and get through this. So everybody loves that part of the talk the most. Um, the title of my talk, Wolves in a Modern Age, kind of summarizes the problem wolves have. Um, and that is they're an animal that has a lot of conflicts with humans. And in fact, when European humans came to North America, the goal was to get rid of wolves because we competed with them. They killed wild game, which we wanted to kill. They occasionally killed livestock, which we wanted to have free range for. Um, and maybe most importantly, they need space. Um, wolves are not backyard wildlife by any means. They need a lot of space. And humans are filling up the world. And so we don't want to give them that space. Uh, and so um, that's an issue. It is a human-dominated landscape. And that's kind of a backdrop to everything I'm going to say, because a lot of people wonder what we're doing in Yellowstone, how far afield are those ideas really going to go? And is what happened in Yellowstone really that interesting? Because it's a, it's a postage stamp compared to the rest of Montana or Montana, Idaho, Wyoming. So that's kind of the problem wolves have. And so I do want to set the stage a little bit about Yellowstone, um, frame it for you, but world, world's first national park. And that's something that I, as a National Park Service employee, as are all the National Park Service employees, and you guys should be very proud of. Our whole enabling legislation policy is preserving um, and restoring nature. And so we are one of the, the only land management agency that has preservation as an objective. Um, conservation wise use is as worthy, and we do need both, but we're one of the few that is to restore nature. And part of nature is this critter. Um, I see my next slide is coming up here. I'll have to get used to that. First time that's ever happened. But this critter was wiped out. I mean, the goal when European humans came to North America was to get them all for the reasons that I stated. And that was no different in national parks. Uh, I mean, this attitude is still prevalent nowadays. There are good animals, mostly game animals, and bad animals, mostly predators. And we want to get rid of the predators. I mean, I've spent my life studying wolves, and I run up against this all the time. And the only thing that's changed really in the last 50 years 
is most everybody used to think of wolves as bad, and now it's a mixed bag. We have this group that some people call wolf lovers who are entering the debate on what to do. But that's, that's where it's at, and a lot of people view that as the eye of wildness right there. You take that out, and it's not really a wild landscape. Grizzly bears are probably there too. But these toothy, large carnivores that need a lot of space, that are occasionally a threat to humans, are what make all this land not totally ours. And really, that's a philosophical question that I pose to all of you. Is the Earth really ours anyway, or do we share it with other critters? That's an open question. And so, <clears throat> Yellowstone 1872, last wolf was killed 1926. You can see these guys, that's actually a coyote pelt. You can see the attitude about wolves. And that was the attitude about wolves uh, all the way up until a few decades ago. And really, the most important thing that happened was a change in people's attitudes. We did not grow more habitat. We don't have more places to put wolves. But people change their mind about how they think about predators. What I just said a couple minutes ago. And how that happens, I don't know. That's outside the realm of biology. How people change their minds about value-laden topics is social science and hard to put your finger on. But that has been the most important thing that allowed wolves to come back onto the landscape. The other thing I'd like to kind of impress upon you, because this is a common misperception, is that a lot of people view Yellowstone, because it was the first national park, uh, 1872, is that somehow its entire history is, is that it was pristine. National parks were mostly founded upon the idea of scenery. And the idea of preservation grew through time to this kind of well-honed policy that we have now. But originally, it was to protect gorgeous landscapes. Yellowstone was set aside because it was a weird place, a fairyland. All these thermal features, two-thirds of the world's thermal features are in Yellowstone. It was set aside for that not because of ecology or wildlife. It was just all these odd features, we better set it aside. Um, so Yellowstone has had many disturbances. That's feeding bears. This is ranching bison, feeding elk, feeding mule deer. It has undergone major human disturbances, uh, forest fire suppression, uh, control of elk, uh, market hunting, fur trade, predator control. Um, all of these things altered Yellowstone. And arguably now, we might be as pristine as we've ever been, which is remarkable in this day and age of constant bad news about the environment. <coughs> and so I'm only going to briefly say this, but this might be interesting to you guys from Butte and Montana, but the vision for wolf recovery was not just Yellowstone. Um, Yellowstone was a release site. Central Idaho was a release site reintroduction. Northwest Montana wolves uh, had restored themselves from Canada through natural immigration. So wolves were listed as an endangered species in 1974. Endangered Species Act was 1973. Um, and the plan, so a recovery plan was developed. That's what you do for all endangered species. To nurture the Northwest Montana population and reintroduce Central Idaho and Yellowstone. And no one ever said the wolves would stay in the park. And it was actually envisioned that these populations might connect each other. Uh, and that, to a large degree, has happened, although the Yellowstone ecosystem is the most isolated of the three. Central Idaho and Northwest Montana have definitely blended together. And, and the Yellowstone area has, for the most part, stayed um, more isolated, although there is some exchange. So I'm just going to be talking about wolf recovery in the park. And besides, um, most of the other wolf work done in this area is management oriented because wolves are controversial. Most of our work is research. So I'm going to get into a lot of that. And so as I said, um, we reintroduced them. And there was some debate about that. Uh, Bob Ream, who taught at the University of Montana, Missoula for 30 years. Uh, he was a state representative. 
uh, actually died last March at 81, was against reintroduction. You know, so a prominent wildlife biologist, he actually set up wolf monitoring in the North Fork of the Flathead River in Northwest Montana before there were any wolves there. So he was the wolf guy in Montana. Right at the get-go, he was not in favor of reintroduction because he felt wolves would get there eventually on their own, and he felt that it would be better public relations if that happened rather than reintroduction. I cannot tell you how many ranchers and outfitters have told me, you cram these things down our throat. Whereas if they come back on their own like they did in, in Michigan and Wisconsin from Minnesota, natural recovery does not have the animosity behind it that the federal government did this. And you guys from Butte know how people feel about the federal government. Uh, so Bob was against it. Um, but um, it's still an open question because what I said two minutes ago about the greater Yellowstone ecosystem being isolated, and we've shown this genetically, um, who knows how long it would have taken wolves to get there. It was a big debate among biologists. They might not have gotten there. I am surprised at how often wolves are killed, um, moving in between habitats, hit by cars and shot. So this is a big debate. Nonetheless, we did it, and that sped things up. This is the uh, first wolf carried into Yellowstone. Um, you know, Yellowstone's big news always. Combine wolves with Yellowstone, and it's gigantic news. So that's in blue. That's the Secretary of the Interior. Uh, at the time, Bruce Babbitt. Ryan Zink, he's the Secretary of the Interior now. He's from Montana. Um, so the Secretary of the Interior at the time carried the first wolf in. This was a big deal. Um, and so this is, I'm not going to take you through all the territory maps, but um, this is the configuration of wolf packs. This is 11 packs um, in Yellowstone now. The circle is we don't have any collars in that pack. We used to, uh, but we lost them, so we can't figure out their territory. Um, and, and wolves are highly territorial. And actually, this is a very important point. I won't linger on it with this map, but it, it kind of is, um, if I can say it this way, their psyche, their mindset, uh, territoriality makes you very competitive. And when you're competitive, you compete with other wolf packs, and this has a lot to do with their ecology. Um, you can see, too, in the northern part of the park, there's, the territories are slightly smaller, and they're more packed in, and that's because there's more uh, abundant prey. Um, what sets wolf population density is available elk and deer. If you live in Alaska or northern Canada, available moose and caribou. But the food source kind of sets the, the carrying capacity for wolves. Now, most wolf carrying capacity is not set by prey because wolves throughout North America die at a very high rate due to humans at a rate of about 80%. We did a study in Idaho, Montana, Wyoming. Uh, came out in 2010, Journal of Wildlife Management. We repeated that study, and because of politics, we couldn't publish it. I won't get into what the politics were. But both studies had 77 and 78% of the cause of death for wolves in the tri-state uh, area were humans. So if you're a wolf, you're probably going to die from a person. And the data aren't that far off for all of North America. There are pockets of places throughout North America where wolves live out natural lives, and that's typically five or six years. I'll talk about that in a minute, but they're not like bears or cougars. They have a very compressed life history. They live life in a hurry. So uh, a mature wolf is two to three. A mature grizzly is probably seven or eight. So wolves live life in a hurry. They're dying young. They're getting killed by people at a high rate. And if you're not killed by a person, other wolves might kill you uh, or prey kill you. So they've evolved to deal with a lot of death. That's why most management prescriptions are like, we can kill a lot of wolves. They're adapted to it. Um, but uh, when, when wolves, the wolf pack territories are packed in there in the north because there's more prey. Um, in the south, there's the, the ungulates leave in the winter. You have fewer wolves. Um, I, I'll, I'll kind of zip through this a little bit. But as I said, Yellowstone World's first national park, what ecological system has straight lines. Again, in 1872, people didn't care about ecology. 
They didn't care about wildlife. I'm exaggerating a little bit. It wasn't that simple. But the park was set aside for thermal features. So those red lines there <coughs> is actually kind of a small ecosystem. Actually, this is an ecosystem of where the northern Yellowstone elk herd winters. We have eight elk herds that use Yellowstone, and that one in red, um, that's their winter area only, is the largest and most famous. It's been studied since the late 1800s. Um, and that's where they congregate in winter. And a third of it's out of the park, and two thirds is inside. And it would make management issues a lot simpler if all of it was inside. But that is the largest elk herd, and that's where the wolves um, are the, at the highest density. And actually, we have 100 of those elk collared. I won't talk much about this in this talk. That's an elk talk. And they distribute themselves throughout the park in the summer. So that's just this elk herd's winter range. And interestingly, we've gotten a foot or two of snow in Yellowstone the last week. Can't believe this in my 23 years here. I've uh, never seen anything like it. And those elk are holding tight. If that snow comes in October, they boom, they move to that red polygon. They move to winter range. That's like a trigger to go to winter range. And none of them have moved in this snow. And it's a foot or two out there. And I'm wondering, what are they eating? And it's this wet, kind of thick snow, and I don't know how they paw through it. So a very interesting sidelight. So this is the um, wolf population since we reintroduced them. Split, I never know which screen to go to here. Um, split into three bars. The tallest bar is the park population. Um, the dark blue is that red area, the blue area. And the light blue is the interior. And what I want you to notice, if you can see it, is that red area, and that was just the red area inside the park, up until 2007, 2008, had more wolves than the rest of the park. So 10% of the park's area had the highest wolf density. And that's because of that very high. And at the time of wolf recovery, in 1995 and 1996, that herd was considered to be overpopulated. And that was the big issue in Yellowstone, too many elk. And so those wolf numbers built up to be very high. And then they declined in around 07, 08. And look at how flat that population has been. And you just don't see that in nature very much. It's always bouncing around. And so actually, when I uh, go to ecological conferences, a lot of questions I get from ecologists are, how long is that going to last? the stability. Because look at the previous 15 years. It was up and down and erratic. And we had a disease outbreak here, distemper. We had a disease outbreak there, distemper. And both times, the population recovered. That was because there were abundant elk. The third time we had a distemper outbreak, 2008, it did not recover, which suggests this is correlation, not cause and effect, some other limiting factor. So we think right now, since about 2007, 2008, the wolf elk system in northern Yellowstone is in some kind of equilibrium. The predator balances their prey. That's very fascinating to watch. And we want to see how long that goes. So a very interesting thing occurring. And this is elk. So the park, I didn't say this, because we ironically killed off all the predators except bears, but we killed off cougars, we kill off wolves, we kill off coyotes, wolverines, bobcat, lynx, the whole gambit except bears. And bears are preserved because Horace Albright, the park's first superintendent, liked bears. So if you don't remember anything else in my talk, personalities matter. A big administrator liked bears. He saved them. And then they went on to have their own history, you know, the dumps, the feeding from your cars. You know that story. But wolves, cougars, coyotes, all those other ones wiped out. And so what do you think happened? The elk population <laughs> starts going up. So what did the park have to do? The big debate in the 20th century was, what are all these elk doing to the vegetation? And therefore, what are they doing to the landscape? You know it. You guys live in Montana. You get too many ungulates out there, they start degrading the landscape. So what did the park do? They started killing them. State of Montana started killing them as they crossed the park boundary. Or there used to be a train track that came right into Gardner, big circle. They loaded on the trains and shipped them to 36 different states and three countries to get rid of all these elk. They did this all the way to 1968. 
policy changed, natural regulation, what I said at the start, attitudes were changing. Plus, one night in the evening news, they showed killing elk on TV. You know, that was back in the day when there was one or two channels, so everybody watched the same channel, not having, you know, a thousand and, you know, two people watch one channel. But it made a big deal. So they stopped killing them. Look what happened. 77,000 elk from 1968 to 1935 were either shipped or killed by the Park Service or the state of Montana. They controlled them, and that's what happened to the elk. So the, the elk shot up. And we had the misfortune to reintroduce wolves right in here at a, histor a, a recent historic high. So when the population's as high as it could get, what's it going to do? Not get higher. It's probably going to decline just because it's at a recent all-term high. So this entire decline here is blamed on wolves. All of it. I still go in the bars in Gardner, Montana, and everybody recognizes me, and I still get cornered going, the wolves wiped out the elk herd because of this graph. So bad timing to start with. But the other thing to look at before I go to the next one, look at the elk herd now. It too has stabilized, that previous slide with the wolves. So at a much lower rate. Now, by the way, this is counted elk. Counted elk. That's five, 6,000 counted elk. And it's well known you don't count them all. You, you miss them. And the average, although it varies from 50 to 91 percent, if you apply citability correction factors to these numbers, that's the, the amount that it varies. On average, you're missing 30 percent. So you could argue that every one of those bars should be 30 percent more is the actual herd size. Even the, the long bars, right? <laughs> yes, sir. That would be over 25,000 elk then. So here you go. Cougars are wiped out. They weren't reintroduced. So we don't know the exact years they came back. But they started trickling back in into Yellowstone in the late 1980s. There's been three cougar studies since the late 80s. And it's felt that their numbers in northern Yellowstone are at saturation as well as wolves. Then there's these guys who were never completely eliminated because I told you personalities matter. But they were much reduced. And their population in the same area has increased. So northern Yellowstone probably has the greatest diversity and density of large carnivores of anywhere in North America. I mean, you get the same mix in northwest Montana, in British Columbia, in Alberta, but you don't get the density. I mean, you go to Alaska, and you got black bears, you got grizzly bears, but rarely are they together at high density. And coyotes live around town, and there are no cougars. In Yellowstone, we have grizzly bears, black bears, wolves, cougars, coyotes, people. The six large carnivores of North America, all there and all at high density. And you won't find that anywhere else in North America. So this is truly a unique situation. They've all come back. And it's probably a greater number than since park establishment, which we were killing them 100 years before park establishment. So a rare moment in Yellowstone history. So this is when I use words like equilibrium and stability, all of you are scratching your heads going, he's just flinging out lingo here or, or jargon that wildlife violence use. So this is why I say we've reached kind of stability. This is a very simple graph. This is elk abundance, wolf abundance. And early on is down here in yellow. And if you plot those against each other, every year this figure's shooting all over the place. Unstable. Look at the last six years. All circling in there. That's, and you know, science is all about evidence. Nothing else in this world today seems to be. Sorry, that was a bad show. But science is about evidence. And that is the evidence for when I say we've reached equilibrium between wolves and elk. But huge wild card, bison. And I'm not even going to get into this. So when I got to Yellowstone in 1994, there were 500 bison in the northern range. 
that red area, and none of them are allowed outside the park, by the way. Now there's over 3,000, pushing 4,000. <coughs> there's the graph. There's my evidence again. Green line, bison numbers growing. The, the blue are elk, the red are wolves. So we're studying intensively wolves and elk. What about bison? Bison are really changing the story. I'm not gonna get into it. Three, bison cons or three elk consume as much as one bison. So if we just swapped bison for elk, um, are bison competing with elk for forage? These are open questions. Um, wolves um, don't like killing bison. We just published a paper on that. Given a choice, they always go after elk or deer. So what do they, how do bison affect them? Well, they do kill some. They're starting to kill more calves in spring. Um, but bison, we have 3,500 to 4,000 bison in a 1,000 square uh, kilometer area. There's usually a bison or two dying each week. And I don't want to anthropomorphize, but those wolves, I think, know that, especially in mid to late winter. They know these bison are going to start dying. I mean, I've seen wolves wait on our oil for a crust to form on the snow. What are they doing? Laying around doing nothing midwinter when that snow is deep and fluffy. They wait for a thaw, for a crust to form, and then they're on top of the crust and the moose are breaking through. So I moved to Yellowstone, I watched these wolves. They're not trying to kill bison. I think they know that these bison are gonna turn up dead for other reasons. You'd be surprised how many die in accidents. Mid to late winter, they start dying of malnutrition and wolves scavenge them. A quarter to a third of all the bison wolves eat die from other causes. So that, that's a huge subsidy of meat, and that could be changing things too. Won't get into this, but in 2011, in addition to wolves and birds, um, I got signed the elk program. So we got a few NSF grants, and we now maintain about 100 elk radio collars, all females. We've talked with FWP about maybe this is a joint study. Um, parts of it are, not all of it. But we want to maintain collars on 100 female elk to help interpret what's going on with this wolf elk story. As all of you know, I don't know where this out, living in Montana, elk are the gods. They're iconic. You know, who cares about wolves when we talk about elk? Well, you care about wolves because wolves eat elk. But they're the true gods around here. And we got to know what wolves are doing to elk uh, in a system where there's no human hunting, at least in the summer. These elk are migratory and leave in the winter. So we are keeping more elk on the air to study this relationship. And a few things we've learned is, one, climate change is real, and it will have an impact, because what wolves do is they kill vulnerable prey. Your average wolf is about 100 pounds. Now, there's a lot of very, you know, pups are smaller, males are bigger than females, um, et cetera, et cetera. But they're roughly 100 pounds. This is a, a cow elk, 500 pounds. A bull elk, 700, 750. You know, do the math. Wolves aren't going to kill any elk they come across. Again, bar talk. You know, wolves kill anything they want. They kill healthy elk all the time. Not true. When the odds are like that, you're 100 pounds and your prey is 700. You know, bison, cows are 1,200, a bull is 2,000. You know, moose start at about 1,000, go up in, you know, much higher. A, a, a bull moose in Alaska is 2,000 pounds too. What do you think wolves are going to do with that? Walk up to it and kill it? No, 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 no. They need an advantage. It's called vulnerability. And the famous wolf biologists of the world cut their teeth proving that. Even white-tailed deer. If you're a healthy white-tailed deer, you can always outrun a healthy wolf. That's the way it goes. Wolf success in Yellowstone runs from 5 to 15%. Flip that around, that means you're failing 85 to 95% of the time. How would you like to go through life like that? You're failing 85 to 95% of the time. They're constantly testing, looking for vulnerable prey. However, what's another form of vulnerability? When you're in belly deep snow, that's probably a healthy elk. Or who knows, this is a hard winter. That winter might be starting to wear her down. But you get deep snow, that's a form of vulnerability. So a lot of people have known this for a while. Severe winters change the math completely. Elk that formerly would have lived probably get killed. And so that, the wolves had an advantage for that year. 
that might be just a short-term blip. But very important about wolf predation, stacks of literature showing them after vulnerable prey. They do kill healthy animals. It's not that they don't, but they cannot make a living doing it. And so if all that's out there is healthy animals, the wolf population goes down because they're gonna have to work a lot harder and get injured and maybe get killed when you're trying to kill something that's healthy. Not like a cougar. Cougar are selecting on size. Wolves select on vulnerability, and many studies have shown that difference. And so, how does that transfer to the seasonal cycle? I don't know where to go. And I don't really, I think the left graph, I gotta start making time up here. But this is the month of the year, and the y-axis, the vertical axis, is how much food they eat in that month. You can see that in winter it's high, in summer it's low because that's based on vulnerability. Elk are in good shape in summer, not as in good shape in winter, so the wolf diet is adjusted. Summer can be very hard for wolves to get through because they they're trying to raise pups at a time when prey gets more difficult to kill. So they switch to things. Wolves mostly eat elk in the winter and bison carcasses. In, in the summer, they'll switch to uh, neonate elk calves or elk calves, deer, uh, bison calves, but they're struggling a little bit. So their diet is different in the summer than it is in the winter. <clears throat> and I gotta make up speed here, but this, this is too much to talk about. Um, but this is early winter, elk are in good shape. This is late winter, elk are in bad shape. I'm generalizing. And you can see the height of the bars. The height of the bars is how much they kill. You can see they kill more in late winter than early winter. And the color of the bars is calf, cow, bull, or unknown. And so you can see their prey selection changes from early to late winter. This is all based on vulnerability. And the other thing I want you to get out of this graph is, unfortunately, biology, no year is like another year. So it's super hard to generalize about what wolves do because every year is different. But there is a pattern there that you can see, and I just told it to you. The other thing that has been really cool to watch is uh, the history of wolf research, largely how they kill has not been seen. I mean, they, they mostly have lived in remote regions, and most of the work has been done with airplanes. And in Yellowstone, they live in the open, they live along the road, we can watch them kill. And so we've understood the behavior of killing elk and bison, and they have a division of labor. And what we've learned is a full-grown male wolf is about 20% larger than a full-grown female wolf. And, what the, and that happens at about age three. In fact, if you watch a wolf through its life, at age three, you, these males just get <coughs> bulky real big, like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something. And they slow down. They start running at a slower pace. And young males and females are still sleek and fast. In fact, young females are fast their whole life. And so how that transfers to killing prey, exemplified here, is these speedier wolves are in front, selecting which elk to attack based on vulnerability. And these big males are running behind, and if we can get the video up, and if there's time for it, you'll see some uh, shots of this. These big, you know, chasing them in a helicopter, I see this too. I've never met a female wolf that did not feel she could outrun the helicopter. But males, I've seen them stop, they're totally gassed, and they turn and they look back at the helicopter like, ugh, can't run anymore. They're big and bulky, and they're good at the takedown and kill. In fact, we've analyzed this statistically and have found a difference between killing success in packs that have no big males versus packs that have one or more big males. And the packs that have one or more big males have a higher success rate than packs that don't. It doesn't mean that packs that don't have them can't kill, but when you're killing something as large as an elk or bison even, we think it's more than one big male. So there's a division of labor in these wolf packs that we've been to tease out by watching, photographing kills and then identifying the wolves in the hunt. <clears throat> but, and again, I gotta pick up speed, 
But wolves live short lives. This is a wolf killed in August uh, by an elk. And by the way, August is the month wolves are killed. Um, it's the, the highest month of the year wolves are killed by elk. In other words, they go to kill an elk and the elk kills them. And August is the peak month. Why do you think that? That's in the month of elk are in the best shape. And September 2nd, they've been eating green grass all summer, high nutrition, high forage. An elk's in as good a shape as it's going to be. A deer's in as good a shape as it's going to be. A bison's in as good a shape as it's going to be. Moose. And so wolves have the problem of we still got to eat. So they're going to press it more. They're going to take more risks. They're going to try harder. And they get their heads bashed in right there. My horse and I, Joker, rode up to that one. And Joker, one of the cowboys that takes care of the horse at our corral operation, actually his son plays for the football team here now, um, tells me, you know, you've taught Joker the smell of dead. You know, at first he wouldn't walk up to a dead wolf like that, or a dead elk. But I rode him enough that he now knows the smell of dead isn't going to bite him. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and I have a video of this, so I don't need to spend much time. Um, we, you know, our entire study hinges on marking the wolves. I don't know where the other radio cars went. I, I do need them back. <laughs> no, no, it's OK. No, you, I just need to walk out of the room with them. Um, but th we, have to, we have to shoot them with a tranquilizing dart. And then this is what I see right out of the helicopter. This is seconds before. That's the gun here. And I, I shoot right there. It's a tranquilizing dart. And you can do this in open country. It was invented in Alaska in the 1960s. Uh, I come from Midwestern heritage. It's forested. Um, you got a leg hold trap. You can't dart because they get in the trees. It doesn't work. And after we've chased the wolf more than once, especially a female, uh, they know the trees are safety. And so you're not going to catch a wolf a second time unless you can get them way out in the open and cut them off because they're going to go right for the trees. Um, but what do you do when you get them? A lot of the story of a wolf's life is often told in their teeth. How old do you think that wolf is? Uh, did you say you're still? Yeah, so she knows that it's very, very low tooth wear. Uh, the kind of, there's no staining. Um, that wolf is almost a year old. I have, we aged it at 10 months. And, you know, so black wolf, it's even got gray flecks in its uh, fur already. But that's the first thing you do after you check their vital signs. When you dart them, um, you look at their teeth. And the teeth gives you an idea how old they are. Um, and then we put a collar on them and we pull blood. And the pull blood, I'm not going to get a lot into this, but it allows us to do genetic work. We have a full pedigree of all our wolves in Yellowstone. And it also allows us to screen for diseases. So that's how we knew that we had three distemper outbreaks. Um, those are the only three years we caught wolves the following winter, pups. It's hard to tell from adults, but pups that were seropositive for distemper. That means they got it and survived it, because not all the pups die. And so that was correlated with high pup mortality. Parvovirus, every year, every wolf we catch, it tests positive to it. So we have no idea what the impact of parvovirus is. So that's a question mark. Um, and then we monitor them. Fly around in an airplane. And at the end, we just lost our pilot. He retired at 80. I guess that's the right time to retire. Um, and so we're, we're struggling to, to replace him. We didn't fly it as much as last year. It's a, it's a big issue. Um, we do have a couple packs that aren't collared. And so we put up remote cameras. That seems to be the rage in biology nowadays. I am not a gadget guy. Um, I hire a lot of young people, like the people in the room here. And it seems like you guys are gadget people. And so they all come to me and go, can we go stick these cameras out on trees and see if we can get pictures of wolves? And you know, I think it just sounds like an excuse to go for a hike in Yellowstone. But they've proved me wrong. And secondly, I thought that it would disturb the wolves, have this camera out there. And that pup does not look bothered by that camera at all. In fact, it ended up pulling the camera off the tree and chewing on it. Um, and so this has actually been a very effective way to monitor <laughs> uncolored packs. But we're out there year-round. Um, these are just slides to uh, show you the hard work. And I have hired interns, volunteers, technicians, over about 350 in the 23 years I've been there. Uh, I grew up in a camp in Ohio. 
And so my dad's life was young people and outdoor education. So I kind of got the, in my blood, the idea of young people out in the outdoors. And so um, that has been something uh, I've enjoyed doing. So they've done a lot of hard work, winter, summer. And you know, the history of wolf research has mostly been a winter activity. That's the easiest time of year to study them. But we, we, we try and be out all year. Um, so this is another remote camera, although this is National Geographic. I don't know if you guys saw the May 2016 issue of National Geographic magazine. First time in the history of the magazine they dedicated an entire issue to one topic. And it was Yellowstone. And it was upon the, the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. So we had National Geographic photographers crawling all over us for two years. So they gave us a couple photos. Not many, <laughs> but a few. That's what wolf pups look like in July. Um, I don't really want to get into this because it's hard. There's a lot of research behind this. I'm running over, but this is more evidence. Again, evidence is key on wo how wolves live short lives. They have a short life history. They're adapted um, to everything speedy compared to say cougars and bears. What this upper left one shows is what I've already told you. Hunting behavior is based on size. Um, this is age here, and it's probability of attacking, selection, killing, and success. And you can see that these are peaking very quickly. They're all peaking at about two to three years of age. Um, the one that's extended is success. And that's hard to say why, but I think it's wisdom. Wolves are learning about what prey to attack. Uh, as they get older. Um, but what was shocking to me is how quickly those uh, figures peaked. Is they, they're really on a fast track. The upper right is reproduction. And you can see this the classic hump-shaped curve that mammals have. Low reproduction early in life, low reproduction late. Um, and then this one is aggression. And it shows the pattern. This is females which basically are very stable. And males get more aggressive, this is age, they get more aggressive as they get older, and it keeps going up. Males just, and which is odd, because all these other things decline with age. They show senescence. This is that territorial thing right here. So the other reason we think wolf males are 20% larger than females is not just because of what I said, killing, but because of territorial defense. The males are more active defending territory. And here's a little bit about that. Wolf live in packs. They're just like human families. This is a small pack. This is mom, dad, and kids. Kids don't do much. They're like excess baggage. The entire world here is focused on them. A lot of pressure. That pack is multi-generational. You have pups, yearlings, two-year-olds, even three-year-olds, plus the breeding pair. They have many options on how to live life. They're trading off hunting, traveling, defending territory. So a very different structure. These packs are at a competitive disadvantage, as you can see here. These two wolves are in trouble. That's one pack, and they are outnumbered by that pack behind chasing them. If they get caught, at the very least they're gonna get injured, and at the worst, be killed. Again, that psyche of how wolves think, territoriality, competition, big part of their life. And so, one of our grad students, woman who still works for the Wolf Project, Kira Cassidy, looked at this. We looked at three things. Who wins in a territorial battle? We had three hypotheses. Pack size, pack composition, and home versus away. You probably, some of you probably watch football, not all of you, and there's always a home field advantage. We wanted to test that with wolf pack territories. Turns out that made no difference. But pack size was a huge difference. You see, if this right here, that's if you have equal pack size. 10 on 10. Follow that line up, I can't reach it. That gives you a 50-50 chance of winning if your pack size is the same as the other one. You go up by one wolf, look at how rapidly that line goes up. The slope of that line is very steep. 
So that means adding on a wolf relative to the other pack has a huge effect on your probability of winning. Huge effect, pack size. But, and it gives people like me hope, what Kira also found out, pack composition matters, and if you can think back two slides ago, the most important wolf in a fight is a male, and an old male is the single most important sex and age class to have in a fight. And Kira actually was bold enough to write this in the paper, and it got accepted for publication, and I questioned her on it, and she says, no, I'm leaving it in, and that's called wisdom. They not only are larger and more aggressive, but as you grow older, you learn more about how to defend territory and what decisions to make and what fights to pick. And that, when she statistically teased it out, had a bigger effect, males, old males, than did pack size, although both are important. And home versus away had no effect. Gotta pick up speed, this is just the only reason I show this slide is to impress you. Don't try and understand it. These are just different pack pedigrees. We don't, catch, we don't just catch wolves to collar them, but we also catch them to get their genetics and we plot out their relationships. Okay, I gotta really hurry up because I got a few more slides after this, but key point here, you've heard a lot of stuff from me now. Mark Twain, greatest American author of all time. He summarized wolf biology. Summarized it in one sentence. Supposing is good. If you think fish stories are bad, wolf stories are the worst. I have told people things that I've seen with wolves. One person. And he goes and tells his friend here. And then a few days later, she comes back to me and says, hey, I gotta tell you the story I heard about wolves. It's almost unrecognizable to me. And it just went, and I finally, after the person's telling me about it, I realized that's my story that I told to Joe. And it went to Sue, and Sue's garbled the whole story to me. All histories are renowned for this, and wolves are worse than fish stories. That's Mark Twain. Supposing's good, but science is about finding out. Mark Twain, who, another one of his quotes was about statistics and how you can make statistics say anything, but he summarized wolf biology in the early 1900s. So here's an example. This is when wolves were most active. This is time of day, and this is how far they move in a 30 minute interval. And my whole career, I've been studying wolves since 1979, pretty great. Um, and when people ask me, when are wolves active? I say at night, I'm wrong. This is dawn based on the time of year. This is dusk and you can see peaks at dawn and dusk. I consider myself a wolf expert. I was supposing we need evidence. We need to find out how many other walks of life are like this. Just a little pet peeve of mine. I gotta go through this quickly, because I really am out of time, but the biggest scientific debate in Yellowstone is what have wolves done to the ecosystem? And it's called a trophic cascade. And it's wolves affecting plants. And wolves don't eat plants. So how do you affect them? Well, elk do. Wolves impact elk. And so do their impact on elk transfer to elk impacts on willow, aspen, cottonwood. We'll leave grasses out, but that's probably as equally a good a question, but it has not been studied with the same debate or rigor. And that has been the biggest scientific debate in Yellowstone. And in the, in the purposes of saving time, it's starting to be a consensus that yes, that trophic cascade does occur. Wolves do impact elk, and elk that changes their impact on woody vegetation. But what the big argument has been, and we have a book due in December, and a big effort of mine has been to try and get these warring factions to come together. And it's very hard to get scientists to agree on anything, but is for them to admit that the mechanisms and wolves might not be the entire story. And that's for sure true. It's way more complex than just wolves. For example, cougars and bears are part of it. 
And other things impact willow, aspen, and cottonwood, like moisture. And lastly, this has not fixed Yellowstone. So the entire 20th century, elk were impacting this woody vegetation. Everybody agrees on that. You can't have 20 years and now say, it's all fixed. It's not. It's in a different trajectory now. It's in a different ecological state. And so people who published things that were saying, Yellowstone's fixed now, really irritated other scientists. But if we can get through all these kind of language barriers, there is a consensus developing that the restoration of all carnivores has impacted the woody vegetation through elk. I didn't mean to tell that story that fast, but in the, in the these are just pretty pictures now. Elk eating willows. This is the story most of the 20th century. And when I got to Yellowstone in 1994, my first year, it was still the story. Elk are eating down the woody vegetation. And now, but what's amazing to me is how things quick, quickly change. Now it's the wolves have eaten all the elk. When I got there, it was the elk have eaten all the vegetation. People are very, very fickle. You learn that quickly when you live in a fishbowl, especially with the federal government. Here's another, that's a calf in a willow stand, bull elk. And the bigger debate, and I don't have time to get into it, well, is it just fewer elk, a numeric effect, or did they change the behavior of elk? They call this the landscape of fear. A rich literature on that, even more debate. I don't have time to get into it, but this appears, again, punchline to be a lot more important than this, although this is occurring too, but we don't feel it is as important. And with this resurgence of primarily willow, you've had a resurgence of beavers, and beavers, as you know, are a landscape engineer. Look at those dams. Another one, another one, but this one brings up a question. The landscape was so long without beavers that stream morphology changed. And what everyone agrees on again is these streams that used to have beaver dams and the water was slowed because of the dam and you got a great a sinuosity to the streams. Without beavers, these streams went straight and they down cut into the, land, into the soil. It's called stream incision. Everybody agrees with that. You know, the, I have to keep saying that because there's so much disagreement you got to kind of take these beachheads of agreement. Um, but these streams in size, this is Crystal Creek, this is one of them. And now beavers are trying to get back in and they're having a hard time because there's not this nice basin anymore where they put a dam in and you get this pond. The, the pond dam is really shallow and they can't overwinter there. So this particular beaver colony has had to make multiple attempts year after year after year to get this place coming around so they can get a deep pond out of it. So again, the landscape's changed because we, we, we change it by eradicating predators and allowing elk to grow so large and there are spinoffs. Uh, this is aspen and they really, the story there is slightly different, tree versus shrub, but really come on lately. This is an disclosure. What it looks like, uh, this is near uh, Pleasant Valley, near Tower, you can see when you put a fence up in the 1960s, what happens when there's no browsing? And to me, that's, that's a compelling story right there. No browsing. And you have an aspen forest in, and you got nothing out. Um, and this is, a, like, look at, there's, and there's two age classes here, old and young. And most aspen forests, not all, and I won't get into aspen ecology, have a more uh, a continuous um, recruitment curve. So, and, and I, I deal with birds in Yellowstone too, and we're seeing, uh, we published, or um, a grad student published a paper in 2010, 2011 actually, on a resurgence of songbirds, because they have responded. Uh, Stella and Mark took me for a drive around Butte. You've got some riparian uh, area rehabilitation going on here in, in Butte. I would love to see the birds in the spring, but these guys, this is the Wilson's warbler. Oh, they're willow obligates. They're increasing. Willow flycatcher, again, only willows. They're increasing. That's a yellow throat. They're a little bit broader. They use other things, but cat birds are coming on. This is a, a great story uh, because of this reduction in elk browsing. 
I don't have time to get into this, but this deals with climate change. We're working on a paper, prey selection, we'll, what, what elk wolves are killing over winter, we're, we're actually linking, we're working on linking to climate effects. Climate affects forage, forage affects elk condition, elk condition affects wolf predation. We're right in the middle of putting this together right now. And then of course, wolves kill things and uh, there's scavengers that come and kill. Those are ravens, vultures of the north. Here the wolves are, they did the work, and then look who took it over, a grizzly. And in the winter, I call them the big five. Bears are sleeping, but in the winter, ravens, magpies, bald eagles, golden eagles, and coyotes hit virtually every carcass, every one. And then you have five or six others that hit some and not others. Uh, this is a carcass. Actually, the, the bear guys did this. This is a remote camera on a bison that got hit on the road. They, they brought it in, and this, these are all maggots right there. You know, to a wolf, they have cast iron stomachs. Uh, a bear, they'll eat anything, doesn't make them sick. Um, but I gotta get to the end, people. People, people. Yellowstone's the best place in the world to view wolves. So we've had to manage hundreds of thousands of people who come, you know, we have four million people coming a year now. Hundreds of thousands are coming just to see wolves. Big issue for us. Um, they love getting close to them. We've had to kill two wolves because of this. They became habituated. They started walking up to people. But when we, people are pursuing them or flipping them food, that almost is a death sentence for that wolf. It is for a bear, we know that. In Montana, we have decades of experience with bear management. You feed them, you're gonna have to kill them. And we're learning the same thing with wolves. So, and education is very difficult. Because for one, people nowadays question education. Oh, can't, that, you know, that doesn't apply to me. And second, you can't reach everybody. Four million people come in the park, I bet you only a million of them get the message, don't feed wolves. So very difficult. And this doesn't make me feel good as a park manager. I'm supposed to protect wolves, and people are chasing them down the road to get a picture. This wolf got hit, dead. But look at the people crowd around it. Um, it's a sensation. Wolves have, you know, ever been in a room when somebody walks in and everything changes? Wolves are like that. They have tremendous presence. People lose their head around them. Look at this. Well, this wolf became accustomed to people. Didn't do anything, ended up getting hit, dead. So, don't have a lot of time on this, and I shouldn't be talking about it. But, what the heck, it's an issue, I deal with it. Wolf hunting. Wolf control, which is slightly different in the north than it is around here. Killing wolves. What do you think about that? I don't have the time to hear all the answers. But probably to have wolves on the landscape, remember, Montana is a human-dominated landscape. We control it. They live at our pleasure. To have that, you're gonna have to kill them. So when they kill livestock, you think you're gonna walk up to the rancher and say, it's okay, just deal with it. Or a hunter hunting deer and elk, and you're not gonna hunt wolves. Even if hunting wolves doesn't have an impact on their population, and a lot of times it doesn't, it makes people be feel better to shoot them. So there's a big debate in social science right now, if that's true or not. Person at University of Wisconsin, person at Ohio State University, so there's no evidence to support that. Wolf hatred trumps it all. People hate wolves before hunting, and they hate wolves after hunting. Poaching is the same before and after. I don't know the answer. The state game biologists for FWP tell me their phone rings a lot less when wolves are not listed as an endangered species as opposed to when they're hunted. So I don't know. This is an open question. This is, that was Wyoming, by the way. That's why those guys track those wolves down with snow machines, and this is Montana. And so where do I get involved with this? All those dots are wolf shot outside of Yellowstone that live 99% of the time in Yellowstone because we have radio collars on them and we have data. Some of those wolves went out and were shot within hours. 
because they're not used to people hunting them. They don't live with people. When you live with people, you know people are going to shoot at you. When you live in the park, people are looking at you in a spotting scope. So they walk out of the park, they're dead within two hours. So the first hunting season at Montana instituted had an unlimited quota from the line of Yellowstone all the way to North Dakota. And so for us, we felt there needed to be a transition zone from complete protection to unlimited harvest. And so we worked that out with Montana and Wyoming. Those are, I don't have a pointer, but these are hunting districts that have quotas north of the park, quotas. Not unlimited hunting anymore. Each of those hunting districts, 313 and 316, these are wolf hunting <laughs> units, not elk deer. Three wolves each. Now we still debate what those quotas should be at, but that's progress. Really hard nowadays. You guys know it. Really hard nowadays. We're preservation, as I said at the start, that's no use, and that's conservation, wise use, and both are worthy goals but they're different. And so hashing that out has been difficult because personalities and politics get involved. But we did it. There's hope. So, I'm, in the, I'm near the end. People are leaving. Near the end. One more quote. This guy's still alive, barely. He's 80 or so. <laughs> no one ever made a decision because of a number. Darn it. I have a PhD. My whole life has been trying to convince somebody of something because of a number. Doesn't matter. They need a story. Here are five stories. White Wolf. You read about her in the newspaper this spring. Shot when she's, I think she was 12. Average age of death of a wolf in Yellowstone is five. Medium age of death is six. What a superstar. She lived that long. She was paired with that guy for nine years. Heck, that's better than humans. That's the longest known pair bond for a wild wolf pack. I'm sure there's one longer somewhere in the hinterlands of northern Canada, but it's the longest known pair bond. She was shot inside Yellowstone National Park in April. Case still unsolved. Reward of over 30 grand. So. She had 20 pups that we know of. 12 made it to a yearling of age. Great story. Alpha female of the 8-mile pack. Again, this is this spring. I'm flying one day. I track her to a mortality signal on the ground, dead. I actually call my crew. I actually text it from the airplane. Said, I got a mortality signal. Here are the UTMs. They hike in, just so happened, this doesn't happen much, there's a New York Times photographer visiting that day. I said, take him in with. He took these pictures. She was pregnant with five pups. Boom. Wolves don't have the luxury to say, my due date's in a week, and I gotta kill this bison or elk, we don't know which, and I can sit this one out. I gotta help right up into the time I had my pups, and she died. And those pups, and so they didn't have a litter. This story is more amazing. I mean, I talk to uh, elementary school kids from time to time, and it's difficult for me. Uh, I never know what to say, but they always tell me, uh, what's a lesson you've learned from wolves? This wolf up above is what it looked like in March or April 2016. In September, or starting in April, the wolf went into a long-term decline. It lost a third of its body weight. We know that because we waited after it was dead. We collared it that winter, and then we waited after it died. And it got its jaw kicked. Again, elk or deer, we don't know which, in April. It broke its jaw in half. I should have brought the skull for you, but I was too afraid that something would happen to it. And it lived four more months with a broken jaw, it tried to heal, and then, in September of that year, killed an elk by itself, alone. It took hours, and another pack moved in and killed that wolf. And I'm thinking, is this what nature's about? I mean, that's an awful story. 
And the wolf had poor marrow, so it was obviously starving to death, but pulled it together, killed that elk. Some people anthropomorphize for its pack. He was the alpha male, lead wolf of the pack. And then another pack moved in and killed him. And he was four months with that broken jaw. Do you know what kind of pain that must have been? I mean, if it was one of us, we'd have been in the hospital on IV fluids and painkillers and multiple surgeries and on and on and on. And this guy's walking around killing elk. I, I, the lesson I tell these elementary school kids is I, after studying wolves, I try not to feel sorry for myself anymore when I'm having a bad day. This guy, 755. Um, you know, dealing with death, if you're the one living through it. So his mate, a Mark Caney pack, was shot 2012 in the Wyoming hunt. And so wolves have a dominance hierarchy that's separated by males and females. The next female to come up to lead that pack was his daughter. Wolves don't inbreed. So he left the pack. He paired with another female, Bretter, and she got killed by it. In a territorial a dispute with another pack, just two wolves. And you're at a huge competitive disadvantage if you're in a pack of two and you go up against a pack of 10. And remember Kira's statistics I showed you? You're, you're seeing duck and you're 10 against two. Then the next wolf he paired with, they're only together for, I can't remember, a month or two. And I asked one of my guys, and he's one of the guys that's out every day, and he does tell us stories and he does anthropomorphize, and I said, Rick. Rick McIntyre, maybe you've read about him in the newspaper. Why, why did that, that pairing with 755 and that female not work? Well, you know, Doug, she was quite a bit younger than him. <laughs> you know, okay, so she left him because he was old. Um, I'm sure that's happened. I mean, who hasn't that happened to him? Um, finally, he pairs with another female, his fourth. His fourth. Breeds with her. Two years of pups, two years. Last year, in the second year, a neighboring pack, three males, this has never been recorded before, three wolves leave the neighboring pack, Molly's pack, moves into the wild pack, and these three males oust him, boot him. He has to, he's hanging out around their rendezvous area, visiting his pups when they're gone, sneaking in. Finally, these three males, he leaves. That's it. Goes east of the park. His collar was old. I have a harder time. I think it's because it's happened to me. Darting old wolves. You know, when you get up there, I'm going to let you go. I don't care if your collar's ready to expire. Just have a harder time shooting these old guys. He went east of the park and his collar quit. We don't know the end of the story. But right now, in, in the middle of Hayden Valley, he's a whoppy pack with those three males that ousted him and that female. I mean, Sometimes you look at it and go, oh, you fickle female. How could you? Your guy. You didn't hang in there with him. You just, these three males came in, and you forgot about him forever. I mean, who hasn't had that happen to him either? But what is, what is she going to do? I mean, what would she, I mean, her life is about natural selection, survival, reproduction, and you've got three big males move in, and you're going to say, no, no, wait, my honey. And you know, she's got a litter of pups, she needs help with them. Yeah, she went over to the other side. These are, these are tough stories, lessons. Last one here, I'm sorry, I'm way over. Um, caught these guys, uh, 2010, they're brothers, 661 and 760. He's the largest, well, let me, let me say this, this is 2010. That's their weight, 116, 117. I mistakenly darted 760 the next year. I thought I was darting a wolf that had a radio collar that didn't work, and you never want to have a wolf out there with a radio collar that doesn't work. It was also Super Bowl Sunday, and I didn't really want to be out darting wolves. But the pilots are like, hey, the weather's good. We got a limited number of days we can work, and everybody's free Super Bowl Sunday. No one scales with anything, so they're like, they call me up, we're going. I'm like, you're gonna be kidding. So we dug this guy, single largest wolf we've caught. Now I've met a lot of outfitters and I cannot tell you how many of them go, these are Canadian wolves. They're larger than the wolves that used to live here. 
they're killing off all our elk because they're smaller and they're not maxed up rightly. And these Canadian wolves weigh 170, 180, even 200 pounds. Biggest wolf we've caught in Yellowstone, how much you think it weighed? Have you heard this lecture before? <laughs> 148. 148. Single largest wolf we've caught. We've only caught one older over 140. And the problem with weighing wolves is that they can have up to 22 pounds of meat in their belly. So you've got to know if you're catching them on a kill or not. Because they'll throw your scale way off. This guy, and this happens, it sounds bad, but occasionally the drug causes them to puke. And when that happens and they got meat in their belly, chunks of meat come up. This guy was puking bile. Stomach bile. His belly was empty. He was a straight 148. No meat in his stomach. Biggest wolf we caught. And so I look at this wolf every time this photograph comes up. And I look at him and I think to myself, you know, I've handled over 500 wolves. And I could definitely kick a wolf in the butt, get back in the helicopter, and go home just like any other job. Like, no big deal. And I wanted to go see the Patriots play that day against the Giants or whoever it was. And I stopped and I looked at that wolf and I looked at that forest behind and I said, what would that forest be like without him? And all of a sudden I became in not such a hurry to get home. But that's what this whole debate's about. You guys know it. You're Montanans. You know it by heart. And I look at that wolf and I go, what is the big deal? What would it be like to not have that? This is another remote camera put up by National Geographic in Pelican Valley at night. Same camera. This is not the sun. That's the moon. And there's a wolf right there. Remote camera. And my question to you is, what is that scene like without them in it? Heart of Yellowstone. Take the wolves out. What's it mean? I don't know. And I bet everybody in here will have a different answer. And there's not just two, better or worse. There's all kinds of different answers. Open question. And then this is a recent photo from Wyoming. Attitudes matter. Remember that? That's how I started my talk. A change in cultural norms. A change in human attitudes brought wolves back. Think about that. A lot of this stuff is up to you guys. Up to you. I said I was raising a camp in Ohio. Uh, you know, youth program has been very important to me. I cannot tell you how hard that is within the confines of the government. If you think Montana Tech's bureaucratic, you ain't seen nothing yet. But these young people deserve a lot of credit. I'm just the guy up here presenting the program. They deserve a ton of credit. Here's our pilot who his first flight over Montana was 1952. He was born and raised in the Panhandle, Idaho. He moved to Belgrade in the 40s. His dad was a World War II vet. His dad had a flying service, taught him how to fly. He, his first flight over Yellowstone was 1960. This is my last flight with him. FAA, another government agency, ran him out of business because he failed his physical. I would rather fly with him with one eye and one ear, which is what he failed on, than about 90% of the other pilots out there. He was a great pilot, and we have still yet to make this difference up. Um, again, I've done all my career trying to convince people because of numbers. But this is the frontispiece to the first monograph ever written on wolves in 1944 by Adolf Murray the wolves of Mount McKinley. And maybe he knew how to change better than I do. In that, what is below that wolf's eyes, remember my third slide, the look of wildness, is a quote from what many consider the poet of the North, Robert Service. The mountains are a part of me. I am fellow to the trees. This stuff's up to you guys, not the numbers, not Yellowstone Park, but to you folks who control what happens on these wild landscapes. 
I went over, I'm sorry, there might not be enough time for the video, nor am I confident we can get the video to work, but I, that's up to Stella. Do you want to try to do, did you have folks, did folks have to leave? This video is five minutes if it works. I'd say let's do a few minutes of question and answer, and that time if you guys, if anybody needs to step out, um, that'd be a good time to do it, and we'll get the video to work. Do you want to try and get this going? Uh, maybe I'll answer a few questions. And I'll just point to you which, if you can get this yeah. up, is. Anyways, uh, thank you very much. Um, I guess we're going to have a question and answer period.